we're, we're grateful that several people have um, signed up for this event. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, go through introductions of everyone uh, that's participating, but I'd like to thank everyone that is joining for joining. We have an event today where uh, we're hoping that, uh, or we will be having uh, two people that work for KEI, uh, Luis Abinader and, and, and Catherine uh, Artisan are, are gonna discuss some of the research that they've done on, uh, on government funding of COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccines and other technologies, but also, um, uh, uh, and I think uh, Luis is also gonna speak a little bit about some of the efforts to get the World Health Organization more engaged in terms of tracking uh, these issues, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, some of the information that will be presented by, by Catherine and by uh, Luis will be things that people have, that some people that follow this issue closely would have, would have heard about in the past. For example, some of the work on, early work on Moderna having to do with the DARPA and BARDA funding that wasn't disclosed by the company. But some of the topics that they will uh, discuss will be, will be new that haven't been discussed before, including um, one paper that KEI is actually publishing this morning as, as we do the event having to do with Regeneron that uh, Luis has done a paper on recently and uh, on, the on the Regeneron antibodies, which is a, a new paper. And then and, and another one that has to do with uh, uh, um, some work on uh, uh, the, the, <clears throat> that Luis is doing on CRISPR technologies and diagnostics. And then uh, Catherine, I think is also going to explain some of the litigation that she's involved in and she's leading on that's recently involved in getting more documents from different federal agencies, including the US Army, the NIH, and, and BARDA in particular, that related to this, this topic. Uh, the format is going to be that uh, uh, Louise is gonna lead, followed by Catherine. And uh, then there's going to be uh, two respondents. One is uh, uh, Paul uh, Fuller, who who's formerly was the head of global intellectual property for Nervatus, and is now working with a startup company. Well, maybe I shouldn't describe it as a startup, but it, it doesn't seem as big as Nervatus to me. And uh, he's a lawyer and a scientist. And then uh, he's also a consultant to the World Health Organization on this topic, or I should say on the, on the issue of COVID-19 uh, uh, licensing or access to know-how and, and intellectual property for COVID-19. And then Alan Tahon, who's the uh, uh, has a long resume in the public health area, among other things, she was the person that set up and uh, implemented the medicines patent pool, uh, initially focusing on HIV, which is then more in more recent years has branched into other areas. She has her own um, uh, a group called Medicines Law and Policy, and, and she is uh, another person I think many of you are familiar with and has followed this issue fairly closely. Uh, so uh, I think we're gonna start with, with Luis. Luis is, uh, is a lawyer, he was, uh, it, he's, uh, currently studying for his PhD in law in the University of Buenos Aires. And um, he's from the Dominican Republic. Are, are you, is that, that's, 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 that's correct. That's the correct way to say it. Um, Luis works for, uh, uh, in, in Washington DC for, uh, and has for some time for Knowledge Ecology International. And he's been one of our key people in, in, in taking deep dives on the role of government funding on different technologies. Luis, I think, believe you have, um, uh, we'd like you to make a, an initial presentation, and then um, I, I think we're going to walk through a lot of presentations before we get to the questions, because uh, we have uh, two main presentations, two responders, and then we'll go to a general uh, Q&A format. So, Luis, would you like to start now? Yes, uh, I'm sharing my screen at this moment. Um, oh, I believe, uh, Claire, can you allow me to share my screen? Yes. Uh, all right, you should be able to now. Yeah, I am. Uh, I believe people are seeing my screen at the moment. Is that correct? Yes. My, my presentation? OK. So thank you, Jamie. I'm going to be uh, talking about government funding and patents related to COVID-19 technology. And like Jamie mentioned, I'm going to be talking about CRISPR diagnostics, antibodies, and mRNA vaccines. And this is work that we have been doing at Knowledge Ecology International. So I'm going to start with CRISPR. 
Um, and a little bit of background quickly on CRISPR technology in general, the US government has made massive investments around uh, CRISPR, the research leading to CRISPR, uh, you know, about $3.7 billion in grants available in Project Reporter. Uh, around 41% of the papers related to CRISPR were funded by the NIH. Um, and about 40% of the patents related to CRISPR actually have a government inter interest in statement. So clearly a massive role of the US government in, in the researching of, of CRISPR. Many of you know probably that CRISPR can be used for gene editing is the most popular application of CRISPR, but they can also be used for diagnostics. And the way it works um, is because uh, you can instruct a CRISPR protein to detect DNA or RNA sequence uh, in a sample and to generate uh, a way of, of visual signal um, if that DNA or RNA is available in a sample. I believe somebody may have to mute. Um, uh, so that can be leveraged for, for diagnostics. Um, there are several companies working in this, um, in this uh, field of CRISPR diagnostics. So given the fact that there has been uh, massive funding from the US government in, in these technologies, and given the fact that uh, it is now being leveraged for COVID-19 testing, we decided to take a look into the patent landscape and licensing of CRISPR uh, technology. And so this is basically what we found. There are four companies, four leading companies in this field, um, two of which already have a test uh, authorized by the FDA. Um, those are the two American companies. Um, an Indian company that already has a test approved in India and the Argentinian company that is working on developing their COVID-19 tests. Um, all of them, as you can see, uh, has some form of public funding, uh, you know, related to, to, their, to their platform. So the two U.S. companies uh, receive funding from, from the NIH throughout their co-founders. Uh, the Indian company uh, collaborated with a public institute to develop their tests, and the um, Argentinian company has uh, Conicet scientists in their, in their staff. So uh, CONICET is the equivalent of the NIH in Argentina. So all of them really, you know, have funding, public funding uh, for their platform. All of them have some form of intellectual property uh, around their technology. So the two uh, US companies have exclusive licenses uh, around CRISPR diagnostics. Uh, the Indian company has a non-exclusive license according to publicly available information. And the Argentinian company has a patent recently filed uh, according, again, to publicly available information. So public funding and almost all of them some form of exclusive uh, 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 intellectual property protection. Um, this is an example of some of the patents that we found that relates to CRISPR diagnostics. Um, as you can see, there, there are several patents relate to the same protein, several patents from different companies. Um, so the Cas12 protein is one of the, the most widely used for uh, diagnostics. Um, the, one of the um, American companies and the Argentinian company appear to have patents on this protein in particular. Same with the Casper 13 protein. Mm -hmm. um, there are several companies that appear to have um, uh, a, uh, a patent on, on, on this particular protein. Um, so. I'll conclude the CRISPR uh, part of my presentation by just saying that given the history of uh, litigation around CRISPR patents and the fact that there's uh, a risk or an actual uh, patent thickening problem because of the many hundreds of patents that has been issued in the US and many more that will be, uh, that are pending uh, for, for patent examination, um, we think that the funders of this technology should be playing a role in guaranteeing the, 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 the licensing policy to be non-exclusive and open. And that applies to CRISPR in general, but also in the case of CRISPR diagnostics for COVID-19. Um, we have made that request in the past, and, and I, I, I arguably that also applies to this particular situation here. I want to quickly switch now to antibody treatments because there's also here a company uh, that has received massive funding from, from the US government uh, 
um, to to develop uh, mm-hmm. you know technology related to specifically to COVID nineteen. That's companies Regeneron, mm-hmm. and um, they. Um, uh, you know, and they have an existing collaboration with Barda uh, from 2017, and uh, in recent in, in in January of this year, they uh, expanded that collaboration to work specifically on COVID-19 uh, antibodies, and so hundreds of millions of dollars, including for manufacturing, which is an ex- another contract they signed in in July. So hundreds of millions of dollars. To, around this particular technology. So we decided to look into the patents that they have already uh, have. And we were surprised to see that they already obtained a patent in the US for their COVID-19 antibodies. Um, This is a patent that was filed in April of this year. And uh, after a prioritized examination, it was uh, granted in September of this year. So that's one of the surprising things about this, this pattern that it happened very quickly, that it's not common. Uh, typically it takes about three years for, for a pattern to be issued in the US. And the other very interesting aspect of this pattern is that it does not disclose government funding, which is remarkable because again, uh, remarkable because again, they have received massive amount of funding for the development of this particular technology, but they also reveal that um, in their papers that relate to this particular invention. This is uh, uh, two papers that were published in Science very recently, um, co-authored by the same inventors that are named in the patent. So this acknowledge uh, funding from the US, in particular BARDA funding. So the patent should have acknowledged that uh, funding too. Uh, this is also information that we, we found in the, um, in the BARDA website which uh, has a, an update that was added recently in June and clearly states that uh, it was because of part of funding that they were able to uh, select um, um, and find these two particular antibodies that they're now using and they have requested uh, the FDA to authorize for COVID-19. So again, the agency itself seemed to believe that it was uh, with their funding that Regeneron was able to, to select this antibodies. So um, we put together that report that Jamie just mentioned in, in the introduction. Um, this report just came out today and we, we will be asking the agency to take a look into this particular patent because it was funded by the US government, although it failed to disclose that. And, and this is uh, where you can find the report in our website. Um, I don't have much more to say about the report because it's just it just came out today. Um, but I do have a little bit of, of updates um, to share about mRNA vaccines. Another report related to failure to disclose government funding in patents. So Moderna is another company uh, that has received massive amount of of funding from the US government to conduct uh, research related to to mRNA in general. Obviously, they have also received massive amount of funding for research related to to COVID-19 in particular. So we decided to take a look into their patent landscape um, and see how many of these patents actually disclose government funding um, because they have, you know, relationship with 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 Moderna um, and with the NIH and with DARPA, and so we found 126 patents uh, that they have obtained until um, um, until August of this year, um, and uh, and none of them disclose government funding, not a single one of them. So we think this is a failure to disclose because even if we look into the papers. Um, that uh, relate to this technology, we find that they actually disclose uh, BARDA, uh, DARPA funding. So if the paper disclosed DARPA funding, it is likely that the patent were also funded by, by, the, um, by the federal agency. Um, if you look into the DARPA website itself, you will find that um, uh, the federal agency itself believe that they actually funded um, this technology. This is a statement available in their website. So again, we put together a report um, asking the agency to to, uh, investigate this failure to disclose uh, government funding in patents related to mRNA. Um, This report came out in August. Uh, It was covered on the same day by the Washington Post. 
um, on the next day was covered by the Financial Times, which actually includes a quote um, from the federal agency confirming that they were investigating this failure to disclose, which was an important uh, information. They, the federal agency reacted immediately to our request um, by launching an investigation around this failure to disclose. Um, other news sources in the U.S. also cover this, uh, this investigation and research that we put out. Um, Senator Van Hollen in the U.S. Um, actually uh, tweeted about our research and our request of failure to disclose. This is important because Senator Van Hollen is a proponent of a legislation in the U.S. that um, uh, will include provisions related to government funding uh, of technology and including a uh, failure to disclose. Uh, I can talk about them uh, later if people are interested. And then um, three weeks after our research was published, DARPA confirmed to KEI that they indeed were investigating the failure to disclose uh, of, of government funding in patents assigned to, to Moderna. Um, more recently in October, Moderna said in a statement that they were not going to be enforcing um, their, 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 their patents uh, related to their mRNA uh, technology, um, including some of the patents that we asked them, we asked the, patent, the agency to, to, to investigate. We asked both BARDA and DARPA to, to investigate. Um, they told the, the Wall Street Journal uh, that they were getting too many questions from investors with regard to their, their patents. So, uh, you know, probably some of the questions related to, to the investigation around failure to disclose. Um, I will conclude, I don't think I have too much time, but I will conclude saying uh, that our work when it comes to, to government funding of technology and transparency is global. Uh, and that includes engagement with the um, WHO and uh, this is one example of things that we've done in that regard. We asked the WHO in, in, in August to, to play a more active role in the response around uh, transparency of COVID-19 uh, research and development. Specifically, we asked, we asked the R&D Observatory uh, to, to create a database of several um, data points, uh, I think, uh, because of time, I will mention that if, if people are interested in, in the Q&A, um, but I do welcome your questions and your comments um, if you have any. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. Luis, uh, what I'd prefer to do uh, is to go through um, all, of, all of the initial four presentations before we go to the, the Q&A format. But I'd like to thank you very much. That was, uh, that was uh, content, that was a, like a packed presentation with a lot, of, a, lot, a lot to work on. Some of the things that Luis has talked about that are new in terms of his slides, we'll be, after the event, we'll be uh, putting on our webpage, both Catherine and Luis's slides, as well as a, a video from this event, because uh, we're recording this event right now. Um, I'd like to turn now to, to uh, uh, Catherine uh, Artisan, who's our, our lawyer. Uh, she's a graduate of, of Georgetown Law School. She's been working um, with us on, on a lot of these projects. She's recently been involved in um, uh, uh, three different lawsuits on uh, freedom of information requests related to uh, funding by uh, federal agencies. Uh, she's also worked with us on uh, uh, looking at some of the more uh, some of the very important but novel issues in U.S. law relating to the obligations to share intellectual property rights with uh, the public if they receive public funds. Catherine, uh, are you? Uh, can you? Uh, you're you're there, right? I I don't I don't really see you, but I, I guess there's 80 people, so I probably don't see everybody. Um, you ready to go, Catherine? Um, yes. You? I'm sorry, I ha I'm having technical difficulties, so I'm just gonna have to leave the chat and come back in, and then I'll be able to present. Well, I can see you. You're doing fine, you're doing fine. You, can see, my, you can see yes. my presentation? Yes. Yeah, I can see okay. okay. Um, I'll just go ahead and hit, hit present. Okay, sorry, I was in a weird format and it was confusing me, but um, all right, let's begin. 
So I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 contracts executed by the United States government. Um, and the format of my presentation will be that I'll start with contracts that KBI has obtained under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and next I'll talk about contracts that were entered into by an intermediary called Advanced Technology International, because there's an interesting situation going on there. And then finally, I'll talk about two KEI lawsuits challenging redactions and withholding of records from our FOIA requests. So KEI has had a very robust um, FOIA research on the United States government's COVID-19 response. We have FOIA'd the research and development and procurement contracts that have been entered into by HHS and then sometimes HHS and the Department of Defense. We've also FOIA'd um, records related to ACTIVE, which is an NIH initiative to coordinate research and development on vaccines and therapeutics. And then finally, we have FOIA'd records related to RADx, which is also an NIH initiative to accelerate the development of diagnostics. These are the contracts that KEI has obtained under the FOIA. Um, as you can see, they are for therapeutics and vaccines, and they range in very high dollar amounts, and the majority of the agreements are OTAs or other transaction agreements. Now, what are other transaction agreements? They are a type of government contract that is legally binding and is entered into for R&D and other purposes. But interesting for purposes here, they are believed by federal agencies that enter into the agreements to be exempt from the federal acquisition regulation, which is a set of regulations that applies to all standard US government contracts. And importantly, for purposes here, they're thought to be exempt from the Bayh-Dole Act. Now, why use other transaction agreements? Why allow the US government to enter into agreements that depart from standard norms that are intended to protect taxpayers? Well, in theory, the idea is all about promoting US innovation by attracting non-traditional government contractors. The first agency to receive the authority to enter into these agreements was NASA. And the thought was that this would enable the United States to remain competitive in the space race because some government contractors didn't want to do business with the government because they didn't want to deal with all of that red tape and they didn't have the capacity and infrastructure to do so. And then another thought was that it would speed up the acquisition process. In practice, one of the main reasons for other transaction agreements and a reason that's been articulated by federal agencies is to allow contractors to exert greater control over federally funded IP data than they would have under a standard vital contract. This is a slide taken directly from a presentation by the Department of Health and Human Services talking about the benefits of other transactions authority. And the final point that they mention as a benefit is allowing for commercially friendly intellectual property provisions with patents and technical data. So why does this matter? Well, to answer that question, it's important to understand what rights the government would retain under a standard by Dole Act contract that applies to the federal acquisition regulation. Now, the policy objective of the Bayh-Dole Act, um, the Bayh -Dole Act sorry, is both to protect, promote the commercial development of federally funded inventions and to protect against the non-use or unreasonable use of the inventions. And to do that, it has rights such as margin rights, the ability to issue a compulsory license to an invention and allow somebody else to manufacture it, including the ability to march in if the contractor fails to take steps to achieve practical application. To understand what that, what that means, it's important to reference the definition of practical application, which includes using the invention in a way that it's capable of being utilized by others and of, that its benefits are available to the public on reasonable terms. And then there's a royalty license that the government retains to practice the invention or have it practiced for or on behalf of the United States government. So very broad language. The rights and technical data under the FAR are very broad for the United States government and can be very important in a pandemic where IP is probably not going to be the only barrier. There's the know-how and technical data required to manufacture a vaccine or treatment that's very important. You'd want that to be as robust as possible. Well, under a standard FAR-based contract, those rights are very broad. They're unlimited. So um, data first produced in performance of the contract or delivered under the contract, regardless of how it's funded, 
gives the government unlimited rights. And that can include giving the data for use by a competitor, um, which would be very important in the response to the pandemic. How does this apply to the COVID-19 OGAs? Well, they redefine practical application to eliminate the words unreasonable terms. And those words are important to allowing the government to address price gouging. They remove two of the board grants for margin rights. They narrow or eliminate the government's royalty free license and they eliminate or weaken the government's unlimited rights and technical data delivered under the contracts. So under these contracts or OTAs, I should say, the government doesn't have unlimited rights and technical data. It has limited government purpose rights that um, allow it to use data within the government so much narrower. This slide is a comparison of the definition of practical application under the Bayh-Dole Act and those contracts versus OTAs. And the definition, as I said before, involves making sure that an invention is available to the public on reasonable terms. In the Regeneron, Johnson & Johnson, and Roche OTAs, the application of the contractor and what it does with the invention is much lower. It's required to either make the invention available to the public for a regulatory product, or in the Johnson & Johnson, it's even lower. It's just making an invention that's capable of being utilized. So this would eliminate um, a grounds on which the government could march in and address some reasonable prices, as I've said before. So the Moderna R&D contract that we obtained under the FOIA is not an OTA. And I think that that's noteworthy because, as I said before, one of the rationales for an OTA is being an acquisition process. But it, um, a report by the Congressional Research Service found that OTAs don't always speed up the acquisition process. And in fact, they sometimes slow it down because instead of having standard terms, more terms are negotiable. So um, I think that this shows that it is possible to execute a standard government contract in a timely manner for COVID-19. Um, it commits nearly a billion dollars for Moderna to perform R&D in scaling up manufacture on the Moderna NIH vaccine candidate, and there's no caution. The United States government is funding 100% of the work on this vaccine candidate. And how we know this is that I was reviewing the contract, and we found a provision that says, in all press releases describing the vaccine candidate, Moderna was required to disclose clearly the percentage and total contribution by the federal government and the percentage and total contribution by non-governmental sources. So we looked at Moderna press releases and it clearly was not complying with this obligation right there in its contract. So KEI and Public Citizen wrote a letter to BARDA and they responded shortly after that they were going to look into the situation and ensure that Moderna complies with this provision. And at the time, we didn't know what the cost sharing was. We didn't know if it was 50-50 or something else. But the next press release from Moderna said that BARDA, is, BARDA which is a component of AHS, is funding 100% of the costs under this contract. So 100% of the development of the vaccine candidate. Um, we also know the cost sharing in the Regeneron OTA because of a Regeneron SEC filing, which says that the United States government is funding 80% of the cost um, of developing the Regeneron treatment that President Trump recently received and was hailing as a cure-all. Now, this slide demonstrates the challenges with the contracts we've obtained. While many of the OTAs we obtained um, do disclose that in data terms, this AstraZeneca advanced agreement we just obtained last week has the IP terms completely redacted. So there's definitely more that we need to know, and we're going to be pursuing that information, as I'll discuss later. What we still don't know is the total and proportionate contribution by the U.S. government in other contracts, and we don't know the existence or not of any reasonable pricing clauses or other terms that would promote affordability and access. So next I'm going to turn briefly to the COVID-19 procurement contracts, and these are even larger than the research and development contracts. They award one to two billion dollars to advance purchase doses of vaccine candidates before proven safe and effective. Now, when the agreements were, were announced, every time an agreement was announced, we would submit a FOIA request. Um, An HHS press release describing the agreements would say that there are a partnership between HHS, DOD, and whatever contractor. So we would submit the FOIA request to HHS and DOD, which I'm sorry, the Department of Defense. Um, we have not yet obtained any of these agreements, but HHS has said that it doesn't have a copy of the agreements that it said itself it was a party to. 
So that led us to finding out that Advanced Technology International, which is a private firm, is actually the party that's entering into these contracts. So the way it works is that the Army actually has a $16 billion OTA with the US government. And then KDI uses that OTA money to enter into sub OTAs with pharmaceutical companies. Um, here is a, a screenshot of an awarded request for proposal. So an awarded contract um, basket, which has Novavax, Pfizer, Sanofi, and Janssen. And these are the ATI sub OTAs that are um, the large contracts to purchase, to advance purchase doses of Novavax, Pfizer, Sanofi, and Janssen, or Janssen and Johnson vaccine candidates. So as I said before, there's a lot that we still need to know, and we have exhausted our administrative remedies under the Freedom of Information Act, which means we've submitted administrative appeals or the NIH or DOD has not responded in time so that we've constructively exhausted our remedies. So we recently filed two lawsuits. The first lawsuit shown here is against um, the NIH, and it's in the District Court of Maryland, and that one covers FOIAs for remdesivir contracts and clinical trial costs because the NIH is actually sponsoring several clinical trials of remdesivir right now, and we want to know how much those cost. And then there's active contracts, Radex contracts, and then there's another potential treatment for COVID-19 called EIDD-2801 that um, is in clinical trials right now. So we want to understand more about that funding from the NIH and its role in that. Um, development, and then we have the conflict, of, the active conflict of interest disclosures. Um, and then the next lawsuit that we filed was just last week, and that's against the Department of HHS, um, sorry, HHS and the Department of the Army, and that is for the R&D and procurement contracts. So concluding thoughts, why this is all important, um, well, affordability of and access to COVID-19 technologies are critical to an effective response to the pandemic. And relevant to those two factors are the relative contributions of government funders and the rights that the government has retained in IP and data underlying the technologies. So transparency is critical and we're going to continue to work to get the full unredacted text of the agreements. Uh, uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, that was a lot of information for everyone. Um, again, like uh, Luis, uh, pretty pretty dense on content, and uh, we're going to have some time now to um, uh, discuss this. Uh, we have plenty of time. Uh, but we're going to start with our, our two discussants. The first one is Paul. Paul Fuller, are you are you online, Paul? I am here, Jamie. All right, and so uh, as I mentioned before, Paul is both the scientist and a lawyer, and he used to he used to manage intellectual property globally for Nevada. So he works for uh, uh, it's. Um, uh, I, I'm trying to get the name of the firm right. It's it's um, Excella. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Like, like the yeah. like the, like the trade sort of. That's how you pronounce it. <laughs> uh, so so Paul, could you introduce yourself a little bit first? because I think not everybody knows you. Uh, and then and then if you have comments uh, on either uh, or both of uh, Luis's and Catherine's presentation. Thank you. Sure. I'll th thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation to speak today. And I'm frankly uh, awed at what KEI's team is able to accomplish in terms of getting to important documents and uh, and I just feel like they are doing such great work. Um, we, we need to uh, continue to encourage them and, and do what we can to support them because this is really important stuff. And, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so a little bit about myself. I've been in the life sciences and counting my uh, graduate degree for some 35 years now. Uh, 30 of them focused primarily in, in intellectual property law. Uh, though recently I've, I've become the general counsel for Excella Health. Um, as Jamie knows, uh, I have a shared concern with KEI and other members of civil society in terms of access to, to medicines and healthcare in general, uh, and feel like there are some 
very important areas of common ground between the industry and civil society or the private sector and civil society <clears throat> to address these issues. So while to some degree uh, natural opponents, um, they're not necessarily natural enemies. And I see a lot of value in finding ways to work together, which is how I've gotten involved in, in some of the efforts here. Uh, but I do recognize a, a couple of important factors of uh, the private sector, uh, which is uh, really the fundamental distribution of risks. And that significantly drives the decision-making process uh, for uh, the, the healthcare system in general, particularly in the United States, uh, which is way out of whack as a result, uh, and for, for new medicines in particular. So I'm gonna try to share my screen to cover some points uh, that uh, I think are germane to the discussion today, uh, because I think the, um, the things that uh, <clears throat> Luis and Catherine brought up are, are really important and uh, deserve a lot of attention. So what about government funded R&D? Um, and I think the thing about it is that that would be understandable, shall we say, in the private sector is the notion of risk and reward. And the private sector will argue, well, we're taking the risk, so we deserve the reward. And what I think uh, uh, Louise and Catherine have really clearly shown is not this time. Um, there is no real legitimate argument that the private sector with the possible exception of Pfizer, and even Pfizer has recently taken some US government money, is bearing the risk of the response to COVID-19. And that is as it should be. I am completely aligned with the expenditure, in some ways inefficient from a pure efficiency sense, because a lot of this money will go nowhere. Of the dozens of vaccines that are being funded, maybe two or three will ultimately uh, be approved and found to be effective. Um, but we don't know which ones. And so we need to fund them all and we need to be prepared to manufacture them all at scale as quickly as possible. And we'll get to, to those issues a little bit. That, that gets to how was the funding used? Now, a large part of US government funding in particular goes to very basic research. And it's really important to recognize that basic research is light years away from an approved therapeutic product. Um, basic research is incredibly important. I am a significant, I'm a big proponent of the government generously funding basic research. And I'm a proponent of the government generally fund, generously funding basic research without many strings attached. I do think the by dole march in rights, uh, whether it's by dole type funding or implemented through other routes is important any good licensor or contributor of technology to another to commercialize it reserves the opportunity to come in and take that technology back if it's not being properly exploited. That's fine. I don't think though that the de-risking that occurs up front is sufficient to justify a large say in how the product is developed or ultimately commercialized. However, when the government invests a significant portion or all of the funding for development and commits to de-risking commercialization, it therefore has a right, and I would argue an obligation to the citizens of that country to negotiate a reasonable deal. And you know, there are people who, who argue that we should have businessmen running government. Um, and I, don't necessarily disagree with that. It would be nice if one day we had a competent businessman running government. I'm not casting aspersions on anyone, mind you. Um, but a good business person who invests, invests with an expectation of a return on that investment. Now the US government probably shouldn't be investing with an expectation of financial return, like a, a Wall Street investor. They should be investing with the expectation of a return for the public good. And actually, I, I say no financial return. It should be a financial return, but in the sense of more affordability of the, the medicines. At this point, M Moderna is essentially a contractor and should be working on a cost plus basis like most contractors. 
not a windfall profit basis. Um, and actually, I use that word windfall. I shouldn't say it that way because if Moderna had taken all the risk, there's a good argument that they would be entitled to whatever kinds of profits they could achieve uh, by selling their ultimate vaccine at, a, at the price the market would bear. Um, that is, a, uh, I would uh, posit, if you want to get investment in the industry, a fair basis for, for pricing. But where the government invests significantly in de-risking the research and development, the clinical development, and the commercialization, the government there has, as I said, a right and obligation to uh, negotiate terms that are beneficial from the perspective of access and uh, affordability. So we need compliance and transparency to ensure that in fact, the government is operating appropriately, just as we insist that public companies disclose uh, much of their businesses, just as investors <clears throat> in a company insist on knowing how the company is spending its money, uh, insist on having independent auditors uh, checking the financials of the company, uh, insist on all of these uh, checks and balances for the operation, that needs to happen here. And you could say, well, that's going to discourage the um, industry from taking government money if everything is, is made public. Fine. My guess is, if the government made this money available, there would be a line of entrepreneurs willing to accept the government's terms and accept this money and do manufacturing and development of uh, development and manufacturing, I should say, of uh, the products that are needed for COVID-19. I know there are companies in this area. Um, frankly, I've founded a company that is uh, interested in doing the right thing. And it's the right thing, not only because of the efficient use of government capital, it's the right thing because this level of transparency actually accelerates all players in the market by knowing what people are doing, by knowing how they're doing it, uh, by knowing what the cost is and where the funding might come from. Other players can plan more efficiently and act particularly in the R&D sphere uh, more rapidly. Indeed, I am a big proponent of maximum transparency. It is a clear and it, uh, individual company competitive advantage to keep its clinical and scientific information as secret as possible to restrict access to its manufacturing technology. The reverse of this is if all of these technologies are widely available, that it facilitates everybody. And if your goal is stopping COVID-19, not maximizing profit for an individual company, that level of transparency is a faster, more efficient way to achieve that goal. Indeed, I cannot understand why government and philanthropic funders don't absolutely insist on maximum transparency. And the assumption that they're not interested in making money themselves, they're interested in solving the broader problem. It's the right thing to do because it makes the system operate more efficiently. So how should governments act as investors? And here I have a lot of inspiration from Mariana Mazzucato, that is an obvious from my slide. The, the government should stop teaching, te sorry, treating taxpayers as suckers whose money is to be taken and given away to private industry without any strings attached. In fact, the government needs to act more as a fiduciary. They need to act as a board of directors or senior management at a company responsible to the shareholders, the taxpayers, and working out deals that do address the fundamental issue, which is a way to address COVID-19, um, and do it in a way that fairly reflects the significant risk that taxpayers have taken in doing this, including uh, the certainty that billions of dollars will ultimately not result in a product. But we come back to that is absolutely the right thing to do in a crisis like this, because some of those billions of dollars will result in a product. And it's totally unfair to the investors in that ultimate product to not only have made the investment and taken on that risk, but then to pay through the nose for the ultimate product uh, instead of paying on a, a cost plus basis. Um, and just finally, this doesn't mean that any company should sell at a loss or absolute cost. They still need to be treated like any individual who works wants to be treated, which is um, have uh, enough money to cover all your costs and, and a fair profit, uh, because these are uh, you know, um, investor funded companies uh, and there is a reasonable expectation of a fair profit. But double, triple underline that word fair and be rigorous 
government as the investor to define fair as a reasonable cost plus and, and nothing more. And let me stop there. Paul, can you, uh, can you show us your face too so people get a chance to uh, get to know you? Because we, <laughs> we just saw your slide for the whole presentation. Well, you but just have to click that little thing in the upper right corner, Jamie. You can see my, my handsome face while I'm talking through the slide. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, but I'm back. Uh, well, that was, uh, uh, thank you very much. And I think that uh, um, it, it, what, what, one of the, P Paul is someone that we uh, at KI, we like to reach out to, to get, uh, uh, well, lots of different kinds of insights because his science background is actually very strong in addition to his legal background and uh, his insight into some of the practical issues about the way companies approach things is something that we think is important for us to understand. and. Uh, and, and like really thank him again for joining and, and sharing uh, those insights and, and also be, being available to take questions from people when we get to that period. The next person I'd like to uh, call up on is, uh, is Ellen Tahone. And Ellen Tahone is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, many people here know Ellen because she has been a, uh, one of the sort of pillars of the access to medicine movement for many years. She's recently received an honor from the King of um, the Netherlands for work in this regard. Uh, she has a very long resume. She's a an advisor to many organizations, uh, UN organizations and governments, as well as NGOs. Uh, she has her own group. Uh, 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 and uh, Alan, do you, I, if you could just briefly, for people that don't know you, make a short introduction about yourself and then provide your comments on the earlier presentations by, by uh, Louise, Catherine, and, and also by Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I don't know whether I have all that much much more to add, but um, I'm currently heading a, a a group of people, most mostly lawyers, not all, but uh, people concerned with with access with access to medicines under the banner of medicines law and policy, and we we provide um, advice and our opinion on on various aspects of access to medicines, mostly related to questions of. Uh, related to intellect, intellectual property, uh, when asked and also when when not asked, um, I was involved um, uh, some years ago. Well, ten, a bit more than ten years ago, actually, with the establishment of the medicines patent pool in Geneva, as Jamie said originally for for HIV to ensure that the production of low cost generic antiretroviral medicines could continue also after countries such as India have fully implemented the, the TRIPS agreement and the, the medicines patent pool has since expanded to work on all essential medicines and is now also focused on, um, on, on COVID-19 uh, COVID and, um, and of course working uh, now with the WHO CTAP and I'll say a few words about that um, in, a, in, in a second. Um, when I don't work on access to medicines and uh, intellectual property issues, I cook uh, and subsequently eat. So now you know what my what my life what my life looks like. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, Louise and Catherine for these very very rich presentations. And it's it's not so easy to uh, make intelligent comments on them because that was a a lot, a lot of information, a lot to process, and very, very, Im very impressive, uh, impressive work. Um, it made me, um, it made me think a little bit about what is going on in in Europe. Um, I'm I'm Dutch. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm currently in France, uh, but we are of course also looking at what is happening at the um, at the European uh, Union level, and as in the United States vast amounts of uh, of government financing is going into uh, the uh, the development and the purchase of um, potential COVID-19 therapeutics and um, and vaccines. I have to fix something on my headset. Just one sec. As in, I should switch it on. Is the sound still OK? Yes. I always love. I always love to watch Brooke's face. He always has such a wonderful smile, but when I speak, so that also makes me terribly nervous. Um, but uh, back to the European Union, uh, also spending billions on the on R and D investment and on pre 
on, on, on purchase uh, commitments. And like Paul, I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and it's, it, it's telling that uh, the, as soon as the, the, the COVID-19 outbreak happened, no government sat back and said, let's just wait and see what the intellectual property system will come up with. No, they immediately uh, uh, sat in the driver's seat, at least in terms of spending uh, start to start to spend spend money on on the development of the of the necessary tool, but what um, what is not sufficiently happening is uh, is is the control over what is subsequently the result of all this government financing um, in the the European Union, for example, the European Commission has. Um, has published not so long ago a, a manifesto on maximizing the uh, accessibility of research results in the fight against COVID-19, which in fact, it, it's a rather good text and has all the right principles. Uh, the, 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 uh, the recipients of EU financing or European Commission financing uh, are, are asked to commit to, uh, to, to sharing data, to, uh, to, to make their, uh, their work public and accessible, to publish open access, and to engage in non-exclusive royalty-free licenses of the intellectual property resulting from EU-funded research. Uh, but this is a voluntary manifesto. People are asked on a website to, to sign it. There's a long list of abbreviations that have signed this manifesto. I don't recognize all that many of them. Certainly none of the companies that have, uh, have obtained uh, vast amounts of, of money uh, this, time, uh, this time around. And what I honestly don't understand, and I think it is something that we need to really continue to hammer on and ask our government why these principles were not written into the hard fun funding contracts. Why are these demands not made on the grantees when the money is, is, is given? When you give billions away, you can certainly attach some strings uh, to them. It all remains in the sphere of, um, of, uh, of uh, voluntary, voluntary actions. And that, that, is, that is a problem. This is also what, what Lewis talked about, the, uh, the role of the WHO R&D observatory should be should be expanded to monitor this. This is the time where the WHO Research and Development Observatory, uh, which is the result of years of negotiations about the need for a different kind of, um, of, of, uh, of innovation system uh, in a way. Um, and that was a very meager result of those years of, uh, of negotiations. But since the WHO R&D Observatory now exists, it should step up its activities and particularly monitor this aspect of the uh, research and development cycle in the context of, of COVID-19. The other issue I want to touch upon is the issue of the confidentiality, the secrecy surrounding, uh, surrounding these agreements. In my country, the Netherlands, the, uh, the, the procurement agreements, the, or the advanced uh, 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 market commitments <coughs> are official state secrets. There is no way to find out what's in them. It is, it is absolutely, um, uh, it, it's outrageous, and it can't it can't really be can't really be explained. Talking about taking um, a tax taxpayers uh, for suckers that is uh, that is certainly uh, the case when your government subsequently enters into all kinds of agreements, spends billions, but you can't really see the terms and conditions of these agreements. Uh, this doesn't only um, this is not only a question of sort of the basic principles of, of good democracies here at risk, but also uh, what happens in these high income countries, North America and in, and, and, and in Europe in, in particular, ultimately affects uh, people the globe over. And the, uh, the conditions that are, uh, that are put on these, um, on these various public financing, uh, do not only affect the citizens of the Euro of the European Union or, or the citizens of North America, but affect citizens worldwide. When I hear Moderna say we are mainly interested in the United States market, I wonder how on earth can you 
can you maintain such a position? Imagine if Moderna indeed comes up with a vaccine that is effective and the demand will be global. How can a company um, uh, say such thing? Now, they've also said, and this is my next point, that they would not enforce, uh, enforce their patents, but that is not enough. And that is another demand that needs to be made from, of these companies and other entities that develop new knowledge and new technologies with uh, with public financing um, that these technologies are transferred it is not sufficient to say oh well should you um, should we think you infringe on our patent will be kind to you no there needs to be a an obligation on those companies on the research institutes whoever else is, is is engaged in in these activities to proactively transfer that technology share it with others and make sure that the data knowledge know-how is is available for uh, the scale of of, um, of of the production of the products that are um that are that are necessary and again here i, I speak to the needs of citizens uh, the globe over we need to uh, think in terms of, uh, of of solidarity. This is not only in the interest of the of EU citizens, citizens of the United States, but we need to have these policies developed and these demands made on the companies with global health and global solidarity in mind. That's not the way the world is going, unfortunately. Instead of solidarity, we see some movements in in more in the in the realm in the charity realm. We'll give some money. You see, sort of the contours of a global fund for COVID-19 uh, emerging and that is uh, uh, that is not that is not exactly the way this um, this should be going. Um, uh, one last comment if um, if I may I don't think that um, the de-risking of uh, pharmaceutical companies investment is only done by uh, the, the financing the direct subsidies up front ultimately we de-risk a hundred percent because ultimately we the public pays for these products whether it's COVID-19 or cancer or HIV a part of the R&D is financed through the public financing such as NIH and the European Commission of Horizon 2020 and what have you but it's also financed because high prices are paid for the products that then go then go to market that is also public money that's also our money um, and we do not have enough say over what actually happens with that money and that needs to change I think we we think, and here's my, my, my last few words, uh, I think we're all hoping that COVID-19 is a bit of a wake up call. It does show, the, it demonstrates the fault lines in the system. And that means that it's also an opportunity to start doing things differently. Over, Jamie. Thank you, Ellen. Um, thank you very much. That was, uh, I think, a, a, a very nice bookend to the presentation, which started out with, uh, discussion of issues about the transparency and the role of government funding in very specific technologies um, or disputes with uh, primarily the federal government in terms of the, some of the transparency issues, followed by Paul's reflections, bringing an industry perspective to the matter, but also sharing a lot of the values that we have on these issues. And then Ellen, I think, focused a lot on the uh, on, on, on the, the role of governments and the, or the governments, the failure of governments to actually step up in certain areas. I think that there's really three primary themes that come through here in terms of uh, issues. One is uh, the lack of, uh, or the need for transparency, to be, put it more positively. Uh, transparency of every aspect from the, from the terms of the contracts to the cost uh, and outlays to the prices that are being paid as well as, as Paul has mentioned, uh, issues about the outcomes of trials that are publicly funded as well, and, uh, uh, and know-how and other issues are relating to the manufacturing of products and the safety of products. Uh, then there's these issues of affordability and pricing. And finally, uh, the need to have greater sharing of the underlying knowledge and intellectual property in order to advance innovation when things have been de-risked in particular, where there's a great, there's, there's a, a much weaker case for proprietary and secrecy when you have government subsidies as deep as they are. I'd like to open it up to questions right now. I know that we have a lot of participants. I think we have, um, uh, Claire, is that right? About a half hour for question and answer. I'd like to take about 
uh, 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 four initial questions from people. Um, you can, you can uh, uh, try and get my attention in different ways, uh, but one would, would be to, um, uh, <laughs> there, I think people are putting some information in the, uh, uh, in, in the chat. I'm gonna start with, uh, is it Rupali, is that, is that what I'm saying? Uh, uh, this is a question about India and South Africa's proposal. Um, I, I think I, I'm going to sort of hold that off a bit and try and get to this this uh, issue that really the focus of the presentations, which were on government funding of technologies. Um, um, uh, Andy Goldman, you had a question about the the remedies for non-disclosure. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that? Hi, everyone. Uh, this was great. First, 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 could you introduce yourself briefly for people? Sure, I'm Andy Goldman. Uh, I used to be over at KEI, as many of you know, I'm at MPP now. And uh, my question is uh, strictly from my personal perspective, not MPPs. Um, so the, the, um, the Bayh-Dole Act, I mean, the main penalty or the big penalty, as I recall, for, for, not, for failing to disclose um, the government's rights and the patents is that the government could take title um, but that is rarely, if ever, uh, done. I mean, it ha obviously it has been done in the past, but it does not seem to be done frequently. Um, and so I'm wondering, I'm just curious for, for your thoughts um, from KEI and others about, you know, if, if that as the penalty is an insufficient stick to get, um, you know, the disclosure, what needs to happen to, to improve that? Thanks. That's it. Uh, uh, Suri, you have a question about, uh, uh, <clears throat> you, you have a question about uh, my, uh, the, uh, something related to CEPI. Could you introduce yourself and then just elaborate on the question you posed in the, um, in the chat? Suri Moon? I think Suri had, to, think go Suri had to drop off. You have to drop off. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that makes it easy. But she's uh, 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 Brooke. Uh, uh, Brooke Baker, uh, could you introduce yourself and then um, share your questions? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm Brooke Baker from uh, Health Gap uh, and also teach at Northeastern University School of Law. I have uh, two questions. Um, one is, uh, I think Ellen's comments in particular spoke about the need to have global returns on, on public investments. And of course, the focus of the presentation was mainly about U.S. investments. Uh, other countries invest a lot, um, but we, 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 I don't think we want to necessarily fall into a rhetoric where the suggestion is because the U.S. taxpayers uh, help front the funds, therefore, the rest of the world, you know, will have to wait to the end of the line until the U.S. interests are served. So, and and, and to accomplish that, it, it seems to me that we could, I, this is a question, should we focus as well as, as some of the back-end responsibilities of companies when they do commercialize, not just the disclosure and potential sharing of the IP and maybe some conditions, but the conditions that would actually require equitable distribution globally uh, and, and not to enforce, um, you know, what, the, what might otherwise be exclusive rights in, in other countries where countries would file patents or have, have you know, other, other comparable rights. So it's really, a, you know, how do we, how do we ensure global uh, global access for for even national funding? Uh, and then the second question is: um, the existing system seems mainly to deal with patents and data, but not very effectively with trade secrets. And we know, particularly in the biologics and vaccine space, that getting access to the know-how, cell lines, uh, other biologic resources is critically important further down the road. So I wonder what what uh, panelists and, and the commentators have to suggest about, you know, ways to really either have the contractual provisions or, if need be, to to think about some some tweaks to the law that would really guarantee access to the that would allow deep and total uh, technology transfer. Uh, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna just collect some more questions. Uh, 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 Moga, you had a question. And could you introduce yourself first? Um, hi, first, thank you so much for a really excellent um, webinar and uh, discussion. Um, so my question to Paul really, so uh, why do, com from companies' point of view, why do companies reject transparency 
and and also in in the case of COVID, reject joining the CETA. Uh, that's a that's a really yes, that's a, yeah. <laughs> it's an important question. Um, uh, Boris, uh, you, you had a question on price. You had you had a couple of questions, or you had a comment and, and a question. Uh, would you like to share that? And could you introduce yourself first? Uh, let me. Where do I meet? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. I I, I had a, a, another thing, so I joined late and. And I missed the, the, the presentations, which uh, I deeply regret. So I look up the, the recording. No, I was just saying on, you know, on this issue of transparency, which is a hot topic also in, in Europe uh, around pricing policy, there is a bit of a disconnect between the, the political calls and speeches for greater transparency and transparency as an end in itself for better governance and so forth, and uh, what the payers think about transparency. I mean, the payers are, are clearly more attuned to uh, the, the practicalities of, of getting companies to compete uh, when they negotiate their price. And the payers are quite, uh, quite aware of the fact that if you publish the price of, uh, let's say, the first company that makes it to the market, uh, then uh, the other companies will simply align their price on whatever is made public. So. Uh, so in a sense, there is a disconnect be between you know, the political calls, uh, all well intended, and uh, the practicalities and the realities of, of a price negotiation. And you, 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 know, you can think about yourself if you're uh, doing some work and you want the different bids. Uh, obviously, you're not going to get a, a better bid if you tell the other companies how much the other is, is uh, giving you. They'll just you know, give you some minus few percent and that's it. Okay, that was my main point. <laughs> uh, fine, we're going to come back to all these issues. Uh, uh, is it uh, Ashley has a question on uh, civil society? Uh, but also, uh, Burris, first of all, could you tell us uh, who you are a little bit, it's just so people have more context for your question? Uh, yes, sorry. So I, I work for uh, MSD, a uh, pharmaceutical company also known as Merck in the US. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and that that's helpful as well. Uh, so Ashley, you had a question. Yes, hi. Yeah, I'm a healthcare reporter at Politico Europe. Um, my question is possibly for, for Ellen. Um, so we've seen for months civil society and also MEPs in the EU um, pushing governments um, on tech transfer and ensuring that IP sharing IP is sort of written into these vaccine uh, contracts, but it seems that this hasn't really happened. Um, and I was wondering whether, you know, what possibility there is in, in governments ensuring that this could, could still happen? You know, what mechanisms, if any, are there to retrospectively um, ensure this? Um, uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Thank you, Ashley from Politico. I appreciate that very much. Uh, one final question, then I think we're going to go to the panel, and that is, uh, is it uh, am I, Rupli, Rupli, am I saying this correct? Is from the, um, he's a journalist from India. I think you write for the Times of India. Is that correct? Rup Rupali Mukherjee. Yeah, that's good. Rupali yeah. Mukherjee. <laughs> Rup <laughs> I'm sorry. So no could worries. You, uh, could yes. you could you make could you uh, uh, yeah introduce yourself and then offer a comment yes or a question yeah sure so um, uh, this is Rupali Mukherjee I work with the Times of India which is a newspaper um, so my question was in terms of uh, basically India and South Africa have moved this proposal at the WTO at the TRIPS Council which hasn't met with a positive response because the rich countries obviously. Uh, do not want to kind of uh, have it pass. So I was just wondering, uh, how can these countries uh, kind of negotiate their way across so that it's kind of taken through? And secondly, how much relevance does it have for affordability and accessibility? Uh, going forward, we have the CTAP and the COVAX already there, already in, in existence. Thank you. Well, we have a we have a, a, a wide range of questions. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to to go to the the panelists uh, and have them offer some response. I, I will. Um, I just want to uh, myself. I interject uh, and 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 offer a, a comment on 
the, the, the question that the gentleman from uh, uh, Boris from Merck, Merck presented, he had this question about the difference of attitude of people on pricing transparency. I've always, I, I, I share some of those concerns that the issue of the transparency of pricing is, I, I've always thought is one of the more thorny issues of transparency for precisely the reason that Boris explained that the, uh, that, that uh, there's a concern that you could have price fixing or you could have, uh, you could inhibit competition in some areas, but I'm not sure that's always the experience. I know that in the, in the uh, Pahu joint, compare, uh, joint procurements uh, for vaccines, for example, uh, every price is transparent and the prices are really, really uh, very impressive. I mean, there's a number of vaccines that are available through that process, which are available at less than 10 cents per dose. I mean, the numbers are like nothing like what we're seeing in the uh, COVID numbers, for example, for uh, uh, the vast majority of the, of the vaccines in that particular thing. So I think that uh, uh, th there, there are some counterexamples on that. Uh, so uh, on, on the transparency side, none of the concerns that you have, I think, on the, on the, on the short-term transparency of prices and discounts and things like that, which is, not, which is really been slow to get to in terms of the transparency debate, carry over to these issues of transparency of the contractual terms, the patent landscapes, uh, the uh, R&D costs, the cost of clinical trials and things like that. But it is, it is probably in some ways, it's a more complicated area for people from, co from a competition point of view. The other thing is that I think that, that uh, in the chat that both Bor Boris and, and Burke have highlighted this issue of know-how and uh, things relating to the, the ability to manufacture biologics and vaccines. I think there, it's important to note that the WHO proposal for pooling technologies includes rights and, and actual transfer of constructive transfer of, of know-how. And if you establish that governments are de-risking and funding research and development, uh, the ability of the governments to transfer both rights and constructive transfer of knowledge of know-how and access to cell lines is not any different than it is for patents. I mean, there's no reason why the contracts don't have provisions on the transfer of know-how. And in some cases they actually do. And I believe CEPI internally within its own structure actually does have contracts that require some sharing of know-how and manufacturing capacity. The problem is it doesn't extend outside of the group of companies that are participating in, in, in CEPI. And all these uh, agreements are essentially secret. So no, we, you know, we don't really even know what they say. And we don't really know, for example, what the particular asks are. But I wanna go to the panel right now to respond to the different questions. Um, and uh, I think I'd go in, um, uh, I think I'd, 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 I'd go in the same order where people originally presented and ask people to make their comments fairly succinctly. Um, I know that uh, Louise and Catherine did not have a lot of questions specifically directed toward them, but you may be able to reflect on some of the questions that were posed by other members of, uh, uh, of the audience that, that, that discussed if you had comments on them. And I'd start with Louise. Yeah, th thank you, Jamie. And, and I want to comment on Andy's questions. And thank you, Andy, for that question. And thank you for your work uh, on failure to disclose it when you were working at KAI. So um, I believe that the penalty is insufficient because it is rarely used. Um, if the federal agencies never take title of the patent that failed to disclose, regardless of the facts, um, they are sending a message to the contractors and that is you know, to the companies and to the universities. And the message is, you don't need to do a lot to comply with this provision. You don't even need to comply with these provisions because the worst thing that can happen is that you're going to have a bad PR day one day if KI publishes a report showing that you failed to disclose. Um, and so if the agency is requested to investigate this and the agency finds that indeed the patent should have disclosed, then all you can do is just to correct the record with a certificate, you know, many years down the road. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, if that is all that they have to do, of course, they're not going to, they're not going to comply. So the, the agency needs to be sending a message, uh, to the companies, uh, by taking title, uh, and setting the example when, when, uh, you know, when they fail to disclose, otherwise, you know, these provisions are, you know, they're, they're, they're there for no particular reason at all. Um, they will never be complied with. I, I think an example of a late disclosure would be the 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 uh, disclosure, right? 
mean, we've seen several we've seen several corrected and belated disclosures that have come in some cases more than ten years after the uh, product was on the market. Yeah, and 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 in the case of Gleevid, uh, we know of a report that recently came out from the House Oversight Committee that uh, they were investigating the funding around the Gleevid patent, the House Oversight Committee in the U.S. And it was around that time when KEI was publishing that this patent should have disclosed government funding and the House Oversight Committee in the U.S. were investigating Novartis for failure to disclose that they decided to correct the record. So it takes all of that uh, to correct the record 18 years after the patent was, was initially filed. Uh, it shouldn't because it is a provision that is currently on the books in the U.S. It should be complied with. Uh, Catherine. Are you are you uh, are you available right now, Catherine? Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> so I think somebody asked about what governments can do to ensure transparency over the contracts, and I think um, I know that on the U.S. government's end, the reason that the government could withhold information in the contracts is Exemption Four of the Freedom of Information Act, which protects trade secrets or confidential information that was um, obtained from a party outside the government. And part of the definition um, or the criteria for being confidential is that the information was given to the government under an assurance of privacy. So the government could make clear when it's negotiating these contracts, one of the things that it could do of many is to make sure, make clear that it's not um, protecting the secrecy or confidentiality of this information. Paul's very interesting presentation mentioned that if the government puts terms and conditions on these contracts, there would still be companies lining up to enter into these agreements. So I'm not sure if um, how companies would respond, but I think with the massive in investments that the government is making, um, transparency of over the contracts wouldn't dissuade them from entering into these agreements. A lot of the information that was redacted from the contracts actually was disclosed by the, the contractors themselves in their SEC filings. So it's clear that the government is overstating or overextending the meaning of exemption four, and I don't believe that that transparency would um, be a deal breaker in this situation. But I would actually like to ask Paul about that and his thoughts on that issue. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Paul, can, can you uh, weigh in right now on some of the questions, that, uh, reflections on the questions that you've heard as well as the ones that were specifically directed to you or ones that you thought you wanted to comment on? Yeah, maybe a, a, a few a few points to touch on it. And why don't we start with, uh, with Catherine's question. I, I completely um, agree that th the government is overly acquiescent and should take a different position on these things, including, I would recommend two steps. Um, one is pre-designate any sections of, uh, of a contract or agreement that's confidential because it's too easy after the fact to just redact everything. Um, and limit that, be really uh, rigorous about limiting that and absolutely insist, as Catherine said, everything else is non-confidential and you've got to know that going in. There's a billion dollars mm -hmm. on the table. You really want to complain about that issue. Um, but this, this raises a more fundamental question, which is how to force the governments to be more transparent and to act as better stewards or fiduciaries of the uh, taxpayers you know, funding of, of the government and its operations. And I do believe that um, the, the work KEI is doing is, is a great start there. There needs to be more. There needs to be more calls for accountability. And again, I think calls not just based on uh, compliance with law, which is independently the right thing to do something. If, if there's a law you don't like, you need to change it. You can't just ignore it, uh, current administration. And um, and so that, that's, that's important, but people have to be calling for that and insisting on it and exposing the government and exposing it also for the other consequences. Because I think there's this issue of we're protecting our uh, private interests and we'll get to how important those are. Um, and that's a really important national imperative. Uh, and it's, it's overstating the imperative, over protecting those interests. And indeed, contrary to the actual uh, best practices that even those companies would engage in, including, as Catherine points out, in their SEC filings. They're, they're afraid of the SEC because of the uh, significant both reputational and financial implications of screwing that up. Um, a quick point on the acknowledgement of government investment. Most 
if not all US universities are really good at this. They're absolutely perfect. And that's because virtually everything the universities are producing had some aspect of government funding. Companies aren't so good at it because they're not used to getting government funding. The government is loath to exact a high price for a mistake. And so is pretty generous about allowing correction. I would agree with Louis that they've gotten to be too generous. Uh, and consequently, you know, nobody is thinking about observing this. And a, and a good message, as has happened in the past, uh, would be helpful here. But bear in mind, too, if the government marches in and takes a patent right, it has to do something with it. The government's not really equipped to set up manufacturing. While somebody else could do it, that's a, that's a year to two year setback in taking a technology from a company that has a year of development behind it uh, or a billion government dollars of development behind it uh, and putting it somewhere else. That, that is, and the government is going to be reluctant to uh, give up that issue. And the final point to sort of the fundamental questions, and I think you know, Brooks in particular raised it, but uh, also uh, you know, just generally, uh, and Moga's great question, why, doesn't, why don't the companies openly, uh, uh, why do they reject transparency? Why don't they participate in CTEP? Years of training, including by people like me, because if you are trying to ensure the economic advantage of a single company, you want to be judicious about what you patent because patent puts information in the public sphere. People think of patents as negative, but it's actually a mechanism to ensure that information comes into the public sphere because by doing so you can protect it. But certain trade secret information, it's hard to protect through patents. It's hard to police. You need to have a patent everywhere. It just moves manufacturing to a non-patent location. So that technology, you wanna keep as secret as possible to protect your competitive advantage. You want to make it. You want to make your neighbor have to redo all that research and engage in all that time and expense and risk of failure that you engaged in, because otherwise they can free ride on your coattails. And in a system where the the private sector is bearing the risk of uh, the translational medicine, clinical development, uh, commercialization, and then um, product liability all on its own, it's, it's, a fair, it, it's fair for them to insist on uh, these mechanisms to protect their competitive advantage. However, that clearly doesn't serve the patient interest as effectively. The patient interest is a therapy as quickly as possible. And I think the very fact that this information is a competitive advantage on an individual company basis tells you that if it were freely available, everybody would run faster. And that, especially in the context of COVID-19, is a more critical imperative and address the other pieces. These companies aren't, frankly, charities. They're there to make a profit. They need to be profitable to be sustainable. And so they are, they are constantly looking out for their own best interest. Sometimes that's in a, a more collaborative or, or cooperative or generous posture, as in treating rare tropical diseases as you know, Novartis did with uh, malaria. Um, but that's a, such a tiny part of Novartis's business. They can afford to be generous there because they are uh, very profit driven in their other businesses. You've really got to be sure that it, it, you to make it worth the company's while. And a really good way to do that is the people with the money insist on it. And that is the investors. And on the far side, the payers who make it possible to earn these huge profits I think on both sides, and especially in the government, they're not asking for enough. They're not being uh, fiduciaries of their investors or contributors or taxpayers, however you want to put it. Um, the money's coming from somewhere, and they're not looking out for the, that money in a, in a fair way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Ellen, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Yeah, th thank you, Jamie. Um, well, I would like to address um, uh, Ashley's uh, question. Um, you know, she says, "Why, why isn't um, uh, why, why isn't CTAP happening? Basically, why aren't uh, governments uh, 
uh, attaching these conditions in, when when they when they fork over the funding for the uh, for for the R and D. And it's true, civil society has been pushing for it, but not only civil society, also around forty WHO member states supported uh, the the establishment of um, of CTAP. Now, I think. Um, we shouldn't despair too soon. Um, of course, I, I, I say this from my experience with the establishment of the medicines patent pool, which took 10 years from initial idea to actually the first licensed site. Now, I hope we can go a little faster <laughs> for COVID-19. I'm not saying, you know, let's relax and, let, and take another decade. Uh, we've also learned a lot of lessons with the medicines patent pool that can be applied uh, this time around. But I think the interaction uh, between governments and uh, the entities that are that are carrying out the research and development um, will not does not end with the with with the funding funding contract. Nothing should stop governments to now politically engage and make it very clear uh, to those that hold the IP and the knowledge the technology, the biologic materials, because of course, in the case of vaccines, it, go, it goes far beyond the, beyond the patents, uh, to be very clear that you want them to, to license, to collaborate with the, uh, the WHO uh, CTAP. There are other players that could play that role. The Gates Foundation is a very active player in all of this. They should engage in this and they should, they should support CTAP. They're not doing that at the moment. And that is, uh, that that is not uh, that is not not very good considering the enormous policy space uh, a foundation like the Gates Foundation occupies that determines a lot what others do and think as well. Um, third, the WHO should be much more proactive. Uh, the WHO was quick to respond to the proposal by Costa Rica and, 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 and took the initiative to establish uh, CTAP, but the WHO should also reach out to those that fund the R&D, including governments, in a more, uh, in a more proactive uh, manner. It is true that this is all voluntary. The world does not have a legal framework to do this in a non-voluntary manner, but it doesn't mean that at the same time, you also see the appetite for non-voluntary measures growing. You see countries, including high-income countries, sharpen, that, sharpen the, 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 the flexibilities in their own patent laws to be able to, 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 to use them should it be necessary. Some countries already, already have done so and last week we saw the discussions at the WTO, the World Trade Organization TRIPS Council on a waiver for certain parts of the, um, of the TRIPS agreement. Now that will not completely uh, replace of course something like CTAP. I think CTAP would be, um, it, it would be, be preferential if that could get off the off the ground now. Um, I think the governments that are funding have, have missed a step by not doing by not doing that in, in, in the first, first, time, first time around, but nothing should stop them to now take, uh, take political action. Just, if you just look back to the, med to the medicines patent pool, one very important aspect that made it make the change from a great idea to actual implementation was the Obama administration being very vocal, very clear with the US companies to say, we want you to make this work. We want you to collaborate with this. And that really was a game changer. A lot of other things happened, but that was a very important uh, aspect of that. And we should see similar movement on a much, much larger scale now. Over. Thank you. Uh, we're right at, uh, within two minutes of when we're supposed to wrap this up, but I, I, I noticed there was a comment from Els. Uh, Els, are you are you still online? And if, if so, did you want to make a comment and uh, introduce yourself first, and then ma and make a comment? Oh, th thanks, Jamie, for pulling me in last minute. I didn't want to take uh, more of your time. So many people uh, know me as well as be having been involved in access and innovation for for many years more from the innovation side and, and uh, I guess, uh, so with uh, MSF, DNDI, Open Society Foundations, and now uh, freewheeling a little bit. Uh, my only comment was actually an addition to, to uh, all the very rich information that was already shared that was very much focused on access and, and how you can leverage government funding to promote uh, innovation and access, but to also say that there is a direction to innovation and that we need to 
actually make sure that the right type of innovation happens. And I think what you see happening today in the vaccine space uh, is actually quite, quite scaring uh, in the sense that, that the bar on what an effective vaccine would look like, what uh, the minimal safety requirements are, etc., is being, um, you know, is not really being directed anywhere. Everybody is focused on speed rather than actually quality innovation, if I can say so. And, and I think there is a unique chance for governments to, to also use their leverage qualitatively uh, in terms of what type of uh, innovation. So thank you. Thank you for this very interesting discussion. Th thank you, Alison. I think you raise a really important issue and that is that when you look at all the money that's being spent on the COVID-19 pandemic on clinical trials, for example, not only in the United States, but in, but in, uh, in China, in Russia, in uh, Italy, in the UK, in Germany, uh, uh, in Brazil, around the world. Uh, uh, we're, we're in a situation where often the design of the trials is something that's really uh, managed uh, often with a very heavy hand from the companies with a, a commercial interest, both on the therapeutic side, I should say, as well as on the, uh, the vaccine side. And it, it, it probably, uh, uh, I mean, there are exceptions to that, of course, the WHO has, has done a good job in its, some of its trial design, but to the extent that there's a lot more public money involved in, in the area of financing trials, one could, one could certainly ask uh, that, that there'd be more attention to the things that were most beneficial for the users of the technology, not just the people that are selling them in terms of uh, the way the evidence is generated on safety and efficacy. And, uh, and, and also helping people make better decisions on formularies. Uh, but I'd like to wind it up right now because we promised to make this, everyone I know has got one Zoom call stacked up after another. And uh, we know we've already lost a few people because they, they, they've had to jump onto other calls. Um, uh, I'd like to thank all four of the presenters for very <clears throat> heavy on substance and good on advice content in their, in their presentations and all the people that offered very relevant and helpful and pointed questions and for everyone being very good on time. So until next time, uh, bye everybody. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Claire, are you willing to uh, hit, the, hit the kill switch here? On it. <laughs> <laughs>